you want more information, I have like a ton, and I mean a ton of stuff on our websites. We have two websites, stage2planning.com is our wealth management site. That's our older one. There's 1,200 blog posts up there I've written over the years on all sorts of things around uh, creating wealth. Sustainablebusiness.co is my uh, consulting site. That's where our weekly video is. We have a podcast that's been going on for almost seven years now. All the episodes are up there uh, and tons of information about that. If you want uh, slides, just email me at jpatrick at stage2planning.com. I'll be glad to send them to you. Or if you want to have a conversation, I love talking about this stuff. And I always give people 20 minutes free. It's one of my favorite things. And my new book is out on the thing there. I am happy after we're done to sign some of these for folks. So if you'd like me to do so, I am happy. And we have eight minutes and 45 seconds to answer questions. This is really cool. I've never had one of these before. <laughs> Yes. We realize that our clients also have CPAs and attorneys and business advisors and things like that. What's the best way that we can interface as a quarterback to all of these advisors for that one? Um, really decide, it really depends on the size of the business. Somebody earlier today, in an earlier session, was actually talking about that, that one issue. And um, I think, oh, it was David York. David was t saying that he thinks wealth advisors should be the quarterbacks for these sort of transactions. And uh, I agree with it if you have some skill around private business. Now understand that you're the one who's having a regular conversation, so you can bring it up. And in the financial planning conversation, you can be asking all these questions that we're talking about today and go and do that. Understand there's two sides to a business. They wrote the sustainable business, which was there's the personal side and there's the economic side. Now, typically what happens is all those folks you just mentioned are technical advisors. They're really good on the economic side. They don't know anything about the personal side, nor do they really want to. We can bring both together. Now, a big company that's worth, you know, 30, 40 million dollars, you can work with all the advisors in a collaborative manner because it's a big enough deal for the owner to afford it. But if you're selling a $1 million, $2 million, $3 million business, it's really cooperation with the other advisors, not collaboration with the other advisors, where you hand things off. And what you might want to do is keep track of where everybody is along the way. Now, the other thing about this, why this is really important to do, and I've seen this happen a bunch of times, I don't know where the Morgan Stanleys and the Merrill Lynch's and the big um, money management firms find this stuff out. But if your client sells a business for $20 million, you're going to have competition. I don't know how they get in there, but they get in there and they start talking to it. And they'll say something like, you know that advisor you had? They were nice when you, were, when you weren't putting that much money away. Now you have some real money and you need real pros helping you. If you're not talking to your client about what you're going to do and help them invest that money two, three years before they sell their business, there's a really good chance you're going to lose that account when it actually does get sold. It's a real risk factor at that point. So we need to be talking about it. And if you have a large number of privately held business owners as clients, the more you can learn about what drives their business, the more valuable you become. Well, it also it really depends on the size. I mean, you know, that's a moot point if someone doesn't have a $20 million business. If it's like, you know, $10, $5 million business, they're not going to likely, I mean, at least they don't let me transfer them. <laughs> you know, 20, 20 million plus? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, in that particular case, they're almost never internal transitions. They are. 
but, but it's, not, it's not sold to the kids. I'm a big proponent of selling the business to the children, not giving it to the children. You can do a combination of that when you get to 20 million, but you get to 50 or 100 million, it's almost impossible to do that. You really have to be using other strategies along the way. And the challenge is, in my opinion, is how do you get that rising generation to have the responsibility around the asset that they're be being given and not having to buy? It's a, real, it's a real conundrum. It's not an area I work in a lot, but it's something that I think is, you know, needs to have a lot of attention. A lot of education, a lot of behavioral education. One of the rules that we have when we have children join a business is you can't join the family business at any higher level of the job you had outside the business. I'm a big fan of family business constitutions, which are the rules of the road for children to join the business. For the big business, you have to do that. I mean, you can't let a kid come in and be a vice president of sales when they were a janitor at their last job. And believe it or not, that happens. And it's almost always a disaster. Yes, ma'am. Great talk. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, Jay Hughes has done some brilliant stuff on this, if you know who Jay is. Jay Hughes is probably the godfather of high-end estate planning. Uh, he's very active. He was one of the, the people very active in the Purposeful Planning Institute when it first started. Really, really bright guy. And he calls it the black hole of the parent, where the parent makes her kids join them in this vortex because of the economic control they exert over their children. It's really important to have conversations with the parents, again, years before they want to do the transition, about that vortex and having the concept that we call a family bank. Whereas, I mean, I was doing with Judy Green at the um, Family Firm Institute. I was during a, uh, a, a business plan competition with her. And I asked her, I said, Julie, what, Judy, when are you going to update this research you guys did like nine zillion years ago of family business transfer? And she said, well, I got to tell you, we don't think about it as family business anymore. We think about it as families in business, meaning that we're putting a pot of money aside that's for education, houses, starting businesses, and having a process in place for how to get a loan from the family bank to start that. So it's really important for parents not to drag their kids into their business, but to give them the opportunity to be in business. Because the truth is, most of those children, or a large percentage of those children, do want to be in business, just not with their parents. So you're absolutely correct. Yes? Boy, that's a good question. He's got three or four of them. Any of them are good. I read all of them. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff there, but he's, he's written th three or four books, which are really good. No, that's John A. Warnick's um, thing. He does a lot of work with that. He, he's sort of like the, he's the, John A. loves these terms. And he's a, a dean, no, he's not a dean, he's a fellow. <laughs> he tries to think it's an academic place, but it's really, it's a good trade association.